Brought to you by the first ever Toyota Grand Highlander. Hello, friends. Jack, Flight School O'Brien here, uh, also known as Jack. Still can touch Ned if I get a running start and haven't eaten heavy breakfast. O'Brien, uh, both nicknames that I go by. Inviting you to check out Miles and Jack got mad boosties for a weekly basketball conversation with me and my co-host from the Daily Zeitgeist, Miles Gray. We are joined by comedians, writers, podcasters, and fellow NBA fans as we discuss the latest news and events from around the league. Check it out. Miles and Jack got mad boosties. Brought to you by the first ever Toyota Grand Highlander. Tired of restless nights? At Lisa, we know good sleep is essential for mental, physical, and emotional health. From memory foam mattresses to hybrids that keep you cool all night long, Lisa's mattresses offer exceptional comfort and support with free delivery and 100 nights to try out your mattress in the comfort of your home. For a limited time, save up to $700 off select mattresses plus two free pillows. Go to lisa.com slash iHeart for an additional $50 off mattresses and select goods. Exclusions apply. See lisa.com for more details. This is draft season. I am John Schmoke, joined by Tony Pauline. By the time you guys are watching this, Tony and I will be in Indianapolis at the NFL Combine. We are doing a little preview before we get there. And then, uh, because remember, the first things done on the field aren't done until Thursday night. And then we'll have our full recap of the Combine coming your way next week. But this will be a little Combine preview. Talk about what's important at the Combine and what players have a lot to prove or could rise or fall based on what happens at the NFL Combine for them, today's episode is brought to you by Visa. Visa looks at over 500 data points on transactions to help prevent fraud. So you can worry less and focus on this podcast. Shop with Visa because security looks good on you. Tony Pauline from Sports Kita. I am John Schmoke. Tony, good to see you, my friend. Are you packed for India yet? Are you ready to go? Uh, packed? No, ready? Uh, you know, I guess so. It'll be the last minute thing, just getting some uh, notes, news and notes. It'll be interesting. One final long trip, unless I go to some pro days before the 2024 NFL draft. Hopefully we'll have some nice weather. Yeah, it's supposed to actually be in the 50s and 60s out there, which for Indy at this time of year, usually we're in the 30s. It's usually freezing. So I think we actually caught a break with that after the Senior Bowl when we had perfect weather. We're like yeah. two for two here. We're And Frisco was good too, a little rainy, but I think we'd all sign up for that. So, Tony, let's talk about the combine first. Um, what's important about it? One, medicals. Yeah. Two interviews, things that we don't have access to. And then in terms of the the timing and the competition – it's numbers in context, right? It, it's, you know, if one player runs a four or five, it's okay. If another runs a four or five, it's not. So it's not just the raw numbers. It's the numbers based on what the expectations are. Do guys meet, exceed, or fall below those expectations? But I know you want to focus on the medicals. Yeah, well, I mean, just, just to build on your point about expectations, I mean, a year ago at this point in time, many of us, everyone thought that Jalen Hyatt could be a first-round pick, early second-round pick. We expected him to, you know, blaze through the 40. He runs a what? Or four at the combine. So, you know, it, it's basically you've got to exceed expectations in those testing numbers. And then you've got to run as fast, if not faster, during the position drills that you ran in the 40. Because what happens is, is sometimes, and we'll talk about this as we go through the positions, a receiver may run super fast, may run in the four threes for the 40 in a straight line. And all of a sudden in the position drills, he's down, down a notch. But as you said, the interviews are important. Most important are the medicals. That will impact a player's draft stock more than anything else. A red flag in a medical could really hurt a player. You know, we all remember Montez Sweat in 2021. Yeah. Potential top 12 pick gets flagged because of heart condition, falls to the bottom part of round one. Trey Smith of Kansas City, you know, coming out of Tennessee, projected day two pick, gets red flag because of his knee, falls to the sixth round. He's had a phenomenal career thus far. It uh, doesn't always work out the way. Star Luda Lady, the big defensive tackle out of Utah, projected as a top five to six pick, gets flagged because of a heart, si a heart situation, which really was the result of a flu, had to go back for the medical combine, the medical recheck, ended up as a mid-first round pick. I can tell you some of my own stories. Back in 2002, which was the second combine I was at, this was before everything was digital. And it was kind of interesting. If you saw a player walking around with a big yellow manila envelope, you knew it was a problem because in that manila envelope were usually the x-ray films and the results of MRIs. And it meant that he was going from station to station to station with those uh, results 
that teams wanted to look at. A guy by the name of Eric Heitman coming out of Stanford. Everybody projected him as a uh, second-round pick. He's walking around with this uh, big manila envelope because there were results in there from his high school days with back and knee injuries. And I'll never forget the guy watching the guy. He was incensed. He was furious. He says, these injuries, they haven't bothered me in college. These happened in high school. And he's screaming and yelling. Eric Heitman went from a potential second-round pick to the seventh round. Wow. And he ended up having a 10-year career starting for 100, uh, started 114 games for the San Francisco 49ers. Brian Mandeville. Brian Mandeville was a tight end out of Northeastern, which no longer has a football program. Brian Mandeville was the first Rob Gronkowski type of tight end. 6'3 and change, 265 pounds, played the position like a wide receiver. This gives you an idea of how in-depth some of these combine medicals are. What happens is Mandeville is expected to be a mid-round choice. Everybody's excited to see him perform. They're doing just a general medical stethoscope exam. And one of the doctors in one of the rooms, because they break up different rooms, thinks that they hear something. They send Mandeville for additional tests. Turns out that he has a, 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 a situation, a condition where the wrong type of concussive blow to his chest could lead to death. He had to retire on the spot. Wow. He won for second opinions, but here's a guy that everyone was, uh, you know, very excited to see, you know, perform. Everybody has guy expectations. Was basically told the combine, you can't play football anymore because of this condition, and he had to find another uh, path in life. So, you know, when you see a player like a Michael Penix, you know of his injury history, and you, you see, well, he looks fine on the field. The combine medicals go a lot deeper than that, as we'll get into. Yeah, and well, let, let's get to it here, Tony. Let's start with quarterbacks here, and that yeah, was a great transition because the guy for me that's number one on my list for quarterbacks is Michael Penix, and it's not because of how he's going to throw the ball. You know, I don't think evaluators take much out of how these quarterbacks are throwing the ball on the field during drills. Uh, you know, maybe you get excited to see them throw in person and throw, you know, right before or after other players for a point of comparison. But to me, it, it's all about, for, for Penix specifically, uh, the medicals. You know, he had the two shoulders. He had the two knees at Indiana. He's been healthy the last two years. And then for all quarterbacks, it's the meetings, right? I think... For a position that ends up being the face of the franchise, how these guys do in meetings with teams to see how they can handle that responsibility and the other mental parts of the game, which is really the driver of that of that specific position. And the other thing going against Michael Penix, if you will, is the fact that he's overage. And what they're looking for in these medicals is, will the guy make it to his second contract? Well, second contract, Michael Penix can be almost 30 years old. Um, so that's that's something else that you're looking for. The interviews you talk about, yeah, I, I mean, there is a belief in the scouting community. There is thought that Penix, especially back in Indiana, was not the hardest worker. They're going to grill him about that. I spoke to some of the Washington coaches. They didn't agree with that. I'm going to kind of disagree with you in the sense about the throwing workout. Yeah, the throwing workout is not overly important, but watch those deep outs. Those deep outs for guys like Bo Nix, J.J. McCarthy, when they throw the ball, 30, 35, 40 yards downfield. The receiver has to run to the cone. The quarterback's got to hit him. Are the receiver? Are the quarterbacks hitting the receivers in stride? Are the quarterbacks throwing the ball with good speed down the field, or are those passes floating? And the quarterbacks are, are the, the receivers are just waiting for the ball to arrive. So that is that is an a what that is basically the money throw at the combine. Those deep outs to the left and the right. That'll be something to watch for certain quarterbacks. I mean, you know that. Jaden Daniels, if he throws, Caleb Miller, uh, Caleb Williams, if he throws, Drake May, if he throws, they can make those throws. Bo Nix, J.J. McCarthy, Michael Pratt, we don't know about that, so it's going to be important for those guys. Have you heard any of those guys will or will not throw? I can't imagine Caleb Williams is going to do much just because right. he is what he is. But right. for May and Daniels, if they care about going two or three, they might have some motivation to throw a little bit. You know, a lot of it depends on what their agents tell them, what their representatives tell them, you know. Jaden Daniels seems like the kind of guy that's going to want to get out there and compete. But if you're Jaden Daniels' agent, do you want him to get out there and compete at the combine, or do you want him to wait to, to LSU Pro Day, where he's going to be throwing to Malik Williams, uh, Malik Neighbors, and Brian Thomas, you know, guys that he is familiar with? Because it's unlikely the way they break it up, they break it out uh, alphabetically. Daniels being D, Neighbors and, and Thomas being to, uh, the second half of the uh, alphabet, they're not going to be in the same group. So, I mean, I think Jaden Daniels will want to throw. He seems like that type of competitive person. I'm sure it'll be a situation where the agents may say, 
I mean, we may want to wait till Friday. We'll, we'll have to wait and see what happens. But I agree with you also about Caleb Williams. I'd be surprised if he participates in the throwing at the combine. The alphabet works in Penix's favor because he will have Polk, Odunzie, and McMillan, which is all pretty close to P um, in terms of those guys working out. Any other quarterbacks, Tony, that you want to mention? No, I mean, I'll be interested to see Devin Leary of Kentucky because he was a highly rated signal caller coming into the 2022 season at North Carolina State, was terrific the first half of the season, was injured, then transferred to Kentucky, and it's not worked out for him. I mean, it was it was a bad move for Leary, it was a bad move for North Carolina State, but he's got those underlying skills to be a real good quarterback. He's a fluid passer, he's got a strong arm, he's a smart guy, a lot of drop passes last year at Kentucky. A lot of situations early on where he's not on the same page as a, as a receiver. I think Leary's one of those guys that can have a real good combine and people could start talking about him as they leave Indianapolis. All right, let's go to running back, Tony. Another big guy in the medicals there will be Jonathan Brooks, the running back out of Texas, where teams will see where he is in terms of his ACL reconstruction, which will give them an idea. Obviously, nothing's for sure. It's still very early. They'll have the recheck again in, in a month at the beginning, middle of April. But try to get an idea of when a guy like Jonathan Brooks is, is going to be ready to go coming off that ACL. You know, massive, especially in a year where who is the number one running back and where is that running back going to end up in the draft? Is it a top running back, Blake Corm? My favorite, I know you're not too high on him. Is it Bucky Irvin? A lot of people like Jonathan Brooks, but you don't know when Jonathan Brooks is going to be ready to play. As far as I'm concerned, you know, I'm going to be really watching and looking for Audric Esteem, who I talked about the last uh, uh, the last podcast. A lot Estimate, people, right? Estimate, Estimate, Tony, I think. Right. Oh, thank you. Thank you. A lot of people, you know, love this guy. They think he's. I've seen him great as a top running back, as a, as a day two pick. I see, a, you know, a, a nice downhill ball carrier. So when I watch him, it's not just the testing, but when they do those cone drills. And, he, you know, he's got to make his way through the cones. Is he fluid? Is he quick? Or is he trying to get this? He have to gather himself. Is he slow up to, to change direction? Because if he does that, you know, he's basically affirming what I believe about him and that he's just singularly a downhill between the tackles ball carrier. Same thing for Braylon Allen. I mean, Braylon Allen's a big guy. He's, a you know, 25 years ago, he's probably an early pick, but he's just very one-dimensional. He's got to show that he can move to the left and to the right, change direction without losing much momentum. I'm with you. I literally had Estime and Allen down with agility listed next to him. How those guys move and how they run, I think, will be very important for them. And then you mentioned Blake Corum, Tony. Look, if he runs a 4.55 on his 40-yard dash, it's fine. Nobody's going to care. But if he's like four sixes or four seven, that's going to be like a huge uh oh, because you get past that threshold point for running backs when you start running that slow. So I think as long as he keeps his 40 respectable, he'll be fine. But I'm curious to see how fast he runs. I think he's going to run under four or five. Let's let, let's see what happens. I think he's going to run much faster than you expect. Hey, if he and runs, I, I know it's not your favorite, but I, I think he can run much faster than you. Hey, look, Tony, if, if he if he runs that fast, then he's then. I, I will go back and look at the tape again because that's his speed is one thing that's that that's a real concern for me. So if he does, then he's going to vault up that board for me. All right. Any other running backs you want to mention? No, no, just those guys. All right. Let's go to wide receiver here. I got a few guys here, Tony, that are important. I think one is Keon Coleman, the wide receiver out of Florida State. And again, I think this is a threshold thing. If Keon Coleman runs like a four, five, two, four, five, three, I think that's fine because that's what he looks like on tape. I don't think that'll scare NFL teams away because that's what he looks like. If he runs slower than that, a big problem. If he runs a lot faster than that, then whoop, he could be pumping himself back into the middle of the first round. And Keon Coleman is one of those guys where I say, watch what he runs in the 40 and then watch his speed during practice. Because let's say he surprises everybody. He runs a 4-4-2 or 4-4-5 in the 40, uh, you know, at the combine. And then he takes the field during position drills. Is he that fast? I mean, is he running the 4-4-5 hypothetically? <laughs> during uh, during the position drills, or does he have to slow up? Because there's football speed and there's 40 speed. Now, what happens is is one of, one of the elements of the combine is if you know a guy can run fast for the 40, you should be able to coach him to run that speed on the field. That's why they do, uh, in large part, the testing drills, to test the athleticism, to say, hey, yeah, this guy's faster and a better athlete than, than we think he is. We're going to have to coach him to do that onto the football field. So Keon Coleman, yeah. Is he if he runs a good forty? Does he practice to that speed? Same thing as I mentioned with the with the running backs. You know, is Keon Coleman? How does he get into routes? Is he quick in or out of routes? 
Roma Dunze and Brian Thomas. Roma Dunze, Washington, Brian Thomas, the same thing. Are they guys that are quick in and out of the routes? Can they make a, le- a sharp left or right hand turn uh, without losing momentum, without, you know, gathering, without uh, basically uh, b- bumping their feet back and forth? And when they come out of the routes, are they staying low? Are they on balance? Are they ready to, to uh, catch the uh, catch the pass? The other thing is, is the smaller route runners, the guys that get separation, Lad McConkey, Taj Wilson, uh, T- Taj Washington of USC, want to see how fast they are because – we know they can catch the ball. We know they can run good routes. You know, but you know, are they four or five guys? Or are they four or five five guys? And is that going to penalize them? One last thing. And by the way, some people think McConkey's running four four too. So I think his he's on my list. I think I think that's a good name. One last guy, Johnny Wilson of Florida State. I'm just going to be interested to see if they have him do any blocking drills because I have Johnny Wilson on my tight end board. Not on my receiver board, but a 6'6, 236 pounds. He's probably going to run the low four sixes, high four fives. I'm, we know he can catch the ball. He's a natural receiver. He wins up with a contested throw. But as we've talked about, he's probably going to get bigger before he, get, before he loses weight. Probably a move type tight end. I'll be interested to see if they have him or ask him to do any blocking drills in, in Indianapolis. Because they do that. I mean, they do alternate position drills where it's primarily it's more so with the with the defenders. Defensive ends will be asked to drop back off the line of the coverage. Smaller running uh, linebackers will be asked to do pass rushing drills. Want to see if Wilson does any blocking drills at all? I'm going to list three of the what I'll call thicker wide receivers. How does Xavier Leggett run? Yeah. You know, on everyone says he's going to run really really fast. Well, it's six one two twenty better with his you know lack of polish as a route runner. I'm curious to see how fast he runs. Malachi Corley, one of these yards after catches guy built like a running back. If he breaks four five, Tony, and he's in the four fours, I think he's going to help himself a lot in terms of his overall speed. And then kind of like the miniaturized version of Malachi Corley, Malik Washington, who we saw at the fr- at Frisco at the Shrine game, another run after catch guy who's a tackle breaker and he's quick. But what's his overall top speed to run past people? So those are three guys that I think they're 40 times specifically. Unlike Coleman, who the three-cone drill is going to be big for him. You know, the three-cone drill is going to be big for Adunze. If they even do it, we'll see. I think the 40 times for Leggett, Corley, and Washington are going to be really critical for those guys. Add Cornelius Johnson of Michigan into that list. Because as we saw at the Shrine game, and as you saw at points during his Michigan career, he's a natural receiver, fundamentally sound. We saw decent route running during Shrine Bowl practices with Johnson for a bigger receiver. And, you know, let's see what his testing times are. Let's see if he runs well in testing. Does he translate that into the position drills? And remember, it's not just the 40 time. It's also the 10 split because the 10 split is granted they're coming out of a funky three-point stance, uh, which, which makes it very difficult. But it's also indicative of the ability to get quickly get off the line of scrimmage and get the top speed. Visa uses advanced AI to help stop fraud, so Brie can be all slurp, no worries. Yum. No, I'm with you in that 100%. All right, let's go to tight end here, Tony. Uh, I'll throw Brock Bowers out there, and I think, you know, we talked to Bruce Feldman before the year here, his freaks list, he's on there. The expectation is that he's going to blow this thing up, which is always dangerous, because he might come out and just run, all right, that's a really good time for a tight end, but if it's not like, awe-inspiring people might raise their eyebrows at it right and he's not the biggest guy he's only 240 pounds so his testing i think for people to be impressed with his testing it's going to have to be ridiculous based on the expectations and the other name i'll throw out there is kate stover from ohio state you said it people tell you that he's going to test off the charts doesn't look like it on tape so i'm curious to see what he ends up doing in terms of the testing numbers yeah, Stover looks like a four seven guy, and I'm told he's going to go in the in the mid to low four fives. We'll see what happens. Getting back to your point about uh, Bowers, I absolutely agree. And what Feldman said, and it's something watches. What is his weight at the combine? How much does he weigh? Because if he comes at the combine and he's three hundred and forty, uh, I'm sorry, two hundred forty, two hundred forty five pounds, does he run? And how fast does he run? Or is it going to be a situation? I mean, we've seen guys who wouldn't get on the scale before with Bryce Young last year. Remember, wouldn't get measured. You know, is he not going to get measured and run? What, what What's going to happen there? You talk about the uh, the medicals. Eric All, out of Iowa. It's a good one. Michigan, was a terrific tight end when he was on the field. Big, athletic, 
caught the ball well, could block, but he's been nothing but injured the past two years. So here's another guy where what are, what are the results of his medicals? And not every team sees it the same. I mean, it's different from team to team. Is a team willing to take a late round flyer on him, hoping that, you know, yeah, the, the medicals aren't that bad. Would they take a middle round pick? Because, I, I mean, before all the injuries, he was worth, you know, a third, fourth round choice. Uh, that's another interesting one. And with the medicals, we're not going to find out until a week or two after the uh, combine. That's when it will start to leak out. And even leading up to the draft is when the teams have their meetings to decide which guys are going to be flagged, which guys are, 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 are going to be penalized around the two, which guys won't be drafted at all, which guys will say, oh, we're fine with these medicals. No question about it. All right, let's go to the offensive line, Tony. Testing is not going to be you know super critical for these guys, but just some names. And I think from an athletic standpoint, Three guys that I think there are questions, guard or tackle. And, you know, maybe not for the first one on this list, but Latham out of Alabama. He's just such a big guy. You know, how well does he move at that size? And I think Tyler S.A. Fuanga, too. Like, you look at his tape at the Senior Bowl, there are some stuff with speed rushers that gave him trouble. What's his three cone? How does he move? How fluid does he look? How wide can he get on his kick? Right? And then you have Fatnu, the guard slash tackle out of Washington. You know, we do not have arm measurements official on him in terms of combine measurements. I'm curious to see how long his arms are. And then how he tests athletically, because if he tests good enough, Tony, why won't a team just keep him out there at tackle? Absolutely. And even if uh, even if the arms are a little bit short, you know, they may leave him at left tackle in camp to see if he can get the job done. The interesting thing with uh, J.C. Latham is how big is he? You know, you mentioned a guy that big. Is he 255? Is he 260? Is he 265? You know, 365, 365. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 365. I mean, how big is that cat? You know, we, we will find out. Zach Zinter, his medicals are going to be very important. Broke his leg in that game late in the season against Ohio State. Was probably a top 40, top 45 pick before that injury. And again, the look at the break. And I heard it was a clean break. I heard he should be ready sooner rather than later. And if he is, you know, there's a team at the top or middle of round two say, we're okay with this. We need an interior lineman. You know, we're going to take him here. If not, how far does he fall? Where does Zach Zinter start to become, you know, more, much more reward than risk where the, where the value is just so great? You go down the line here, uh, Andrew Rayum of uh, Oklahoma. How does he test? I mean, you know, he, he's strong. He's explosive. Is he mobile enough to be a power blocker? Christian Mahogany of Boston College, who we saw at the uh, Shrine Bowl, you know, his medicals and his testing is all, are also important. Yeah, and then um, I'll just throw out one other guy with medicals, Tony. Um, another broken leg, actually. Zach Frazier out of West Virginia, the center, another guy that teams will take a look at in terms of where he is in terms of his recovery process. Frazier could be a second-round pick. Um, a lot, I know a lot of teams do really like him and the way he plays and things of that nature. All right, anybody else on offense, Tony, that you want to yeah. touch on? Well, one more offensive lineman that we talked about before, Matt Goncalves, who uh, was highly rated coming into the season, had a toe injury. I think he played two games, had surgery on the toe, sat out the rest of the year. You like the film. You know, how big is he? Is he going to be, is he 320, uh, 30 pounds or more? Is he under 330? How is he going to test? The film is real good on Mount Matt Goncalves. You got to make sure, I'm sure what the medicals will be okay with the toe injury, but you got to see how he tests. Does the testing, does the athletic numbers match up with what you see on film? All right, let's jump over to the defensive side of the ball, Tony, and let's start up front here. I'm going to go Jared Verse as my first edge guy I want to take a look at here. I, you know, his tape's so much fun. He's got power. He's got strength. He's got burst. You know that hoop drill they're on at the combine? The how much the guy can bend and get around the circle and pick up the towel and put it back down? I want to see how well he bends and how flexible he is to go along with his power, speed, and burst. I think that'll be a real interesting thing to take a look at. I like Verse a real lot, but he doesn't look like a 4-5-5 guy. He doesn't look like a 4-6-2 guy. He looks like a guy who's probably going to run in the high 4-6s, low 4-7s, although he plays fast. So that may be a situation where people come out of it and say, oh, he only ran 4-7, but he plays fast. Um, you know, we talk about the medicals. <laughs> You, you could make the argument that the the two most important medicals or, or one of the most important med medicals is for Latea Latou of UCLA, who basically was told at University of Washington, you got to retire because of medicals. 
transferred to UCLA, and then has lit the world on fire. So again, you know, the doctors go deeper, real deep into the situation. You know, where did, how are his medicals? Is he going to, if he's taking the first round, is he going to last five years? Is he going to be a guy that's on the sidelines? That is going to be a real interesting one. And by the way, his yeah. testing also is important, I think, too, because I don't think he's an elite athlete. So I'm curious to see how Latu tests to complement what obviously is unbelievable production and technique on tape. And I think Latu is a lot like uh, Javid Burks. He's probably, I'd be surprised if he runs in the four, uh, four, five, five area. He's probably more of a high four, six, low four, seven guy. But again, you know, you got you got to decide what that what that means is how much upside does the guy have? You know, the guy's not a great athlete. Does he have great upside because of the fact that he's, you know, he's not a super fast guy? But the tape, you know, tells you a lot. Really and three cone, by the way, not just a 43 cone is very important for the edge rusher spot. Teams take that very seriously. A guy who I think is going to blow it up, and I've been told he's going to blow it up, and people are going to be talking about is Byron Murphy of Texas. Uh, a very athletic defensive lineman, can play tackle, can be a two-gap end. Uh, I'm expecting some really fast times, really fast times at uh, two, maybe in the four sevens at uh, 285 pounds. So keep an eye on that. Want to see how Adisa Isaac looks because he's also uh, also has always been very uh, athletic on the field. Uh, had a, had a couple of, as we saw, had a couple of good days of practice at the Senior Bowl. And Austin Booker out of Kansas. I mean, third year sophomore. When you watch the film on Austin Booker. He's a little bit thin. He struggles getting off blocks, but he is fluid. He is explosive. He's also nasty, but he's also very athletic. So, again, with Booker, it's not just the straight line speed. It, it, it's the ability to, you know, it's the three cone. It, it's the short shuttle. But with Booker, it's also what I want to see is making plays in reverse. Because Booker, during the position shows, because Booker was really good up the field, very explosive. But when they asked him to backpedal, it was a nightmare. I mean, he was very stiff and and if you can't do that, if they don't think you can do that, or it's going to be a while before you can do that, that's going to devalue your draft stock a bit because you go from being versatile to more one-dimensional. Yeah, no, look, I'm with you. I'll throw two other guys out there, Tony. Uh, Braylon Trice, I think, is interesting. Yeah. You know, he's a guy that has a great motor. His production, his number of pressures at Washington were off the chart. But I don't know what kind of athlete that he is. And I think how he tests is going to go a long way towards determining how teams treat him as a prospect. And then Chris Braswell, who I think has really been kind of lost a little bit here in this conversation. If he tests off the charts really, really well, I think he can sneak himself back into late first round consideration. And I expect him to test off the charts. I, I mean, he's known as a guy who's going to probably jump in the high 30s. He's going to run really fast. And I would agree with you. I don't have him as a late first round pick, but a lot of sneaky things happen late in the first round. You know, Darius Robinson of Missouri, a guy who's getting a lot of late first round uh, uh, narrative conversation. I had him in, in the late first round going to the Baltimore Ravens, 6'5", 286 pounds. I mean, he's a guy who could get on the 4'8". And again, during the position drills, watch, he's not just a straight line guy. He's a mobile, nimble guy that can go sideline to sideline, redirect and change direction. Yeah, I'm with you. So I think how those two guys end up testing uh, will be essential here. Linebacker position, Tony. Actually, why don't we go interior defensive line? I'll throw one more guy in there. You mentioned Murphy. I want to see what Jerzon Newton tests at as well. Another guy who I think has been competing with Murphy for the first defensive tackle off the board. And not the biggest guy, but since he's not the biggest guy, he's going to have to move really, really well. So I think and how he ends up moving is going to be key. Yeah, he's short is what it is. So and when you're short, you're probably you're not, you know, you're not gonna be able to add or you're not expected to have great growth potential. I think with Newton, same thing with Murphy is it's that's when you're really looking to 10 yard splits. I mean, if Newton runs a four nine nine or five one two, big deal. I mean, he's not gonna be asked to run 40 yards on the field. What you want to do is you wanna look at those 10 yard splits. You wanna look at the uh the three cone because it shows a change of direction, same thing with the short shuttle, and again. Is does he move well during position drills? Yeah, it'll be key. Linebackers, Tony, who do you got on your list for that position? Well, you know, I, I just mentioned uh, uh, Letu is one of the most important uh, uh, medical situations. Uh, Peyton out of uh, North Carolina State, Peyton Wilson is is going to be another one because Peyton Wilson on film looks like a top forty five pick. He's also expected to test relatively well. Probably going to run in the four sixes. 
at 240 pounds, but he's been a medical nightmare since his days in high school. And he's missed a lot of time because of knee and shoulder injuries. So Peyton Wilson, even if he blows up the testing, even if he looks good in position drills, where he goes will be dictated by how teams read or evaluate the, his medicals. Agree 100%. All right, let's go to the defensive backfield here, Tony. I'll throw out two guys that I think right now are on the edge of the first round and they could move a little bit here. I think Kool-Aid McKinstry and Ennis Rackestraw, though I'm not sure Rackestraw is going to do anything. He's recovering from injury, so I don't think he's going to do anything at the Combine. You can correct me if I'm wrong there. And by the way, Cooper DeGene will also it announced today that he will not be working out at the Combine either. Um, but I think how Rackestraw eventually runs when he runs will be key. Again, I'm, he wasn't healthy enough to participate the Senior Bowl. I don't think he's going to participate the Combine. We'll see. And then I want to see how well Cooley McKinstry runs. I, I think if he can you know, get into the low 4-4s, four I think that'll help him. I think he will. I mean, he looks fast on film. As far as Rakershaw is concerned, I mean, the testing is important. He's a smaller guy. I, I don't think he's a first-round guy. I think he's more of a day-two nickelback type. You know, let's go back to your interview with Quinnon Mitchell at the Senior Bowl where he said he wants to set world records, you know, at the Combine. So I'm going to be interested to watch his testing numbers to see if they match basically his words because we know he's a great uh, – he's an outstanding cornerback. I, I mean, this, this is a guy who – Literally, since September of 2023, even though he was a good cornerback before that in Toledo, his draft stock has been on a straight shot north. And he was good as a senior at Toledo. He was terrific at the senior ball. You know, he starts to put together some outstanding numbers. There was talk of the senior ball. He could be the first cornerback taken, which you thought, nah, I don't think it's going to happen. All of a sudden, if he's running the four threes, he's jumping well, and you see that athleticism. I don't think it's out of the uh, I, 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 a reach that he could potentially be Quinn Mitchell. Toledo could potentially be the first cornerback selected. Any other defensive backs or safeties, Tony, that you're going to keep an eye on? Bo Braid of uh, Maryland. He's got excellent size, six foot two and three pounds. I expect him to run in the uh, in, in the uh, four fours. Obviously, Cameron Kitchens. Smaller guy, want to see how he goes sideline to sideline. Malik Mustafa, one of my personal favorites. You know, he doesn't look super uh, athletic on film, but going back to Bruce Feldman, he was on Bruce Feldman's freaks list when we had him on the show. He expects uh, he he expects Mustafa to uh, test off the charts. Uh, Tyke Smith uh, from Georgia, a guy who was great at West Virginia, had injury problems, had a good season uh, this year at Georgia. You know, is he fast or is he more just an opportunistic defensive back cornerback? Yeah, and look, I don't know how important the timing is for safeties, Tony. That's such a mental position, seeing things and reacting quickly. Um, you know, you obviously have to threshold, but that to me is one of the positions where I'm not overly concerned with what the testing numbers look like. I, I think with the safeties, uh, Taylor Mays, you remember him out of USC. I mean, he was a guy who, had turned into an Olympian workout 10 or, or, or 12 years ago, however long it was. Uh, you want to watch that sideline to sideline movement. You know, are they, they could be super fast in a straight line, but if they got to make a left or right hand turn, you know, are they equally as fast laterally as they are in a straight line? Three cone will tell that, short shuttle will tell that. The position drills will also tell us that. All right, Tony, I got one fan question for you. They replied to our last podcast we put up. Then I'll get your final thoughts here before we say goodbye. The fan question, this one comes in from T-Mills. He wants to know, I listened to the show and I'm confused. Why is Bo Nix brushed aside so easily? A quarterback that threw for 4,500 yards, 45 touchdowns, three interceptions, completed 77% of their passes, has all the athleticism and arm at quarterback, but he's relegated to the second or third round. What am I missing? Well, I mean, does he have all the arm necessary? I, we didn't see that at the Senior Bowl, did we? I mean, that was one of the questions that had to be answered for Bo, by Bo Nix at the Senior Bowl. And, you know, when he had to throw, put a lot of power in the passes, he was usually high of the mark. I mean, he he's a, he was a terrific college quarterback, as was J.J. McCarthy. But he looks more like a game manager who, in my opinion, who really did well in that system. And you know, is he a number one franchise-type quarterback at the next level? I believe you can win with game managers, but that's not what they want these days. They want a guy that's going to carry the team on his shoulders and, and, and be just a great playmaker. I don't know that Bo Nix, or in my opinion, Bo Nix is not that on Sunday. I think he could be a real good quarterback, but when you look at what they want at the position these days, 
He just doesn't screen first round. So many short, quick passes in that offense, Tony, getting the ball out of his hands quickly. Not a ton of downfield stuff. When he did it, you know, Troy Franklin caught a bunch of deep passes, so he can. But again, I'm with you. I think we need to see a more consistent downfield acumen from him before we start putting him into a first round conversation. Though then again, with with inflation at the quarterback position, not just in the economy, folks, in the at the quarterback position as well. Um he, he, you know, he could very well, along with McCarthy and Penix, end up being first round picks. We'll have to wait and see how that goes. All right, Tony, final thoughts here before we get on planes uh, from the tri state area here and head off to the combine. Well, I, you know, I, I know nobody mentions kickers or punters, and it's understandable why. But, you know, one guy I'm interested to watch is Tory Taylor, the punter from Iowa, who could be a day two pick. And I'm not just watching him, you know, kick the stuffing out of the ball. What happens is, is, if you ever watch the specialist, the punters uh, kick at the combine, which a lot of people usually don't, they'll put the uh, garbage cans down, uh, usually about 40 yards downfield from the punter. And the punter has to get the ball, kick the ball, punt the ball as close to the garbage can as you can. Dory Taylor doesn't have just a great leg. He's a good directional kicker. So I want to see if he can actually punt the ball into the garbage can 40 yards downfield to the left or to his right or to both. That's great. Hey, look, here's what I love about the combine. One, you talk to everybody around the league and you get an idea. Yeah. Basically, what this is, folks, for the folks that have never been out there, this is basically like the NFL convention. You know, industries have conventions where everyone that's in the industry goes to these things. That's what this is. It's an NFL convention. Everyone's there. Everyone talks to each other. News starts breaking out about free agency, about, you know, Justin Fields could be traded. While we're out at the combine, Tony, and then we'll have an idea of what the Bills, uh, what the Bears are doing. You know, if he goes to the Patriots, then we'll know what the Patriots are or are not going to do at number three. So we're going to have a lot of, we might get some answers to stuff out there. We'll learn what some teams are thinking. You know, rumors start coming out. We see if the co coaches and or general managers say anything at their media availabilities on Tuesday and Wednesday. So we get all that information. Then the other thing that I like to do, and obviously we had this ability to do this at, at Frisco at the Shrine Game and at the Senior Bowl in Mobile as well. You get to stand next to these guys, right? When they're at the podium doing their media availabilities, you're five, six feet away from them. I like to kind of get to the side of the podium and you kind of look at body types to yeah. see how thick or long these guys are. You know, I've now been covering a team and I'm in the NFL locker rooms for, good Lord, 16, 17 years now. I know what guys at certain positions are supposed to look like. This is what an NFL linebacker looks like. This is what an edge rusher is supposed to look like. This is what a cornerback, receiver, go tight end, go down the list. And I think just getting an up-close look at those body types gives you a better feel for how NFL teams see him. Because look, drafting and evaluating, there's a lot of factors. It's complicated. But sometimes it's easy. You just look at the guy and you're like, does that dude look like an NFL player that I want to put out there for 16 games that I think that can be a great player in the league? And sometimes it's that simple. A lot of, you know, you, a lot of free agency talk at the uh, at the NFL Combine. We'll see how deep it goes. And you mentioned Justin Fields. I don't know that Justin Fields is going to be traded during the Combine, but the week after the Combine, I would expect Justin Fields to be moved from Chicago to another team. Yep, it'll be fun to see. Tony, can't wait to see you out there, my friend. Look forward to it, John. That's Tony Pauline from Sports Kita. I am John Schmelk. Today's episode was brought to you by Visa. Visa looks at over 500 data points on transactions that help prevent fraud. So you can worry less and focus on your next podcast. Shop with Visa because security looks good on you. For Tony Pauline from Sports Kita, I am John Schmelk from the New York Giants. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe to Draft Season on your favorite podcast platform. And we're going to have coverage on our Giants platforms at the Combine next week. Make sure you check it out. We have live shows, Big Blue Kickoff Live, every day from 1230 to 130. Not just talking Giants, talking the draft experts, analysts, all that stuff. Check it out if you like the draft coverage and the Giant Subtle Podcast. We'll have a bunch of interviews with uh, draft folks as well as we kind of get to learn about this class even a little bit deeper. We'll see you then, everybody. Enjoy safe flights to everybody that we'll see out there in Indy. Introducing the Lisa Chill Collection, your answer to hot nights. These mattresses beat the heat with ultra-cool covers, whisking away heat for the perfect sleep temperature. Save up to $460 on chill mattresses and get two free pillows when you shop now iHeart listeners can save an extra $50 off by visiting lisa.com forward slash iHeart. That's l-e-e-s-a dot com slash iHeart. Exclusions apply. See lisa.com for more details. You deserve to treat yourself. 
So turn your tax refund into a U-fund and give yourself a Straight Talk Wireless Extended Silver Unlimited plan and get a new Samsung Galaxy A14 on them. You can get a great everyday value on wireless with Straight Talk's Unlimited plan starting at $25 a line per month for four lines. You'll save so much, you'll be enjoying that refund all year long. It's the refund that keeps on refunding. Find Straight Talk at straighttalk.com or at your local Walmart store. Taxes and fees not included. Offer valid through 41424 while supplies last. Online only. Must purchase a Straight Talk extended Silver Unlimited plan to qualify. Limit of five phones per customer. Family plan discount with four lines all on the Silver Unlimited plan. Not combinable with auto pay discount.